Perfect. Yep, I can certainly do that. All right, so before we begin, everyone, I just would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land of which we're all gathered today. And I know we're all meeting in different parts of Australia, but I'd still like to pay my further respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So I just wanted to welcome you all today. Thank you for spending the time with us and joining us on this uh, live webinar today with um, Jeff and myself. My name is Lauren Gray and I'm a compliance specialist here at Gray Management Systems. Um, my focus is more on compliance uh, geared towards the human services sector and health sector. Uh, I am a current uh, practicing auditor for several certification bodies, which I do on a freelance um, provision. Uh, and I, so I, I uh, will conduct 9001 certifications, human services and NDIS as well. So, um, yes, I do some consulting and training in that space too. So I'd like to also introduce Jeff, who is our director here at Grey Management Systems. So welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah. Would you like yeah. to just tell everyone a bit, a bit about yourself? Yeah, well, I've um, been doing this for probably 30 years, uh, compliance that is. And um, my specialty is uh, the audit process and the training of auditors. Um, that's my been my bent and thoroughly enjoyed the ride. So. Um, here we go again with a new standard and a new subject, so that's good. Absolutely. So it's pretty exciting anyway. And, and I should say too, there um, initially we were hoping to discuss more information about um, a new course that we're hoping to launch later this year. It's going to be an accredited course. However, because of our own compliance obligations, we have our own regulator with the Australian Skills Quality Authority. Uh, we can't speak about that at the minute because that's in the process of um, uh, having our scope um, considered and uh, updated. But what we are going to cover today is some um, you know, helpful hints and tips into actually managing compliance um, in your businesses and in your particular roles. So whether it's you're just looking for some useful information about managing your own compliance responsibilities in relation to your roles and responsibilities um, or um, something a little bit larger. Maybe you are um, have been given the uh, job of implementing a particular standard, um, a management system standard, or uh, maybe you're the NDIS compliance manager for your organisation or whatever you where, wherever you might be from um, so yeah we're going to cover off on here so it really will apply to a, a range of type of roles um, and we hope that you find it really interesting so what we're going to do is i'll just quickly share my screen and hopefully uh, everyone can see that please let us know in the uh the chat there um if if you can't see this um so just to start off with you, obviously, most of you have found the chat box. Uh, we really try and keep these webinars as interactive as possible. So if you've got any questions as we go along, please um, feel free to, um, you know, ask those questions. Uh, Jeff, can you see the questions uh, or the, and the chat box on your yep. screen still? Perfect. So uh, I'm a little bit blindsided here with how I'm sharing my screen, but as long as you're over it, that's okay. So I'm going to take you through the first part of this webinar. Um, feel free to connect with us. Uh, we are um, we're really um, committed to building a positive community around compliance, and we have clients from all types of sectors, right from aviation right through to aged care. Um, you know, human service standards, transport safety. Uh, food safety, the, the whole shebang, basically. So we are all about compliance. That's non-financial, essentially. So feel free to um, connect with us on LinkedIn. We always try and release a new blog every month and provide helpful tips and um, tricks for people who, you know, need to manage compliance, whatever that might look like in their business. So the webinar will go for 45 minutes today and we know that your time is precious. Uh, so we will try and keep to time. Uh, just to give you an overview of what you can expect today, uh, we're going to just start with a little story about Chris. Chris is not actually a person, but an amalgamation of um, many clients and students of ours over the years. So it's a really great way to, to start this, uh, this webinar. Uh, we're then going to introduce you to... Um, uh, the ISO standard of um, compliance management uh, and we'll talk, I'll talk to you about what 19600 actually is and sort of what it says and where it's actually going to in the future with 37301. If you have no idea what an ISO standard is, don't worry about it. Uh, we will explain it. Um, Jeff is um, a bit of the, uh, the ISO guru, I guess. 
So we'll, it's just a, basically a international standard for best practice. So we'll get into that as well. Um, then we're going to talk about, go back to the basics. Well, what is actually compliance? What does that mean for us? Um, you know, is it a requirement? Is it commitment? And then Jeff is going to take us through some uh, steps that we've brought together to assist you all in effectively managing compliance in your business, essentially to make your jobs a lot easier and to um, basically curtail um, any type of liability or risks that may uh, emerge with um, the impact of any non-conformances or breach of compliance. And then we'll follow up with a short Q&A at the end. All right. So, um, Jeff, did you, would you like to introduce everyone to Chris? Oh, hi, everyone. Um, well, there's lots of Chris's out there, but um, I've had through experience over the last 20 years that uh, when it comes to compliance, uh, senior execs perhaps are not across uh, all the requirements they need to be, and they give it to Chris. Um, Chris is their go-to person. Yeah. Someone who's uh, been an achiever in the workplace, someone who's loyal, someone who gets things done. And um, a lot of Chris's we've seen out there have um, become stressed out because um, there's more and more compliance obligations emerging. Um, just to give you one in the printing industry, I, I did some work there at one stage and I met a Chris and he had offsiders that were looking after um, oh and compliance. Um, he had another guru that was looking after the environmental side of things. And um, Chris had the sole function of looking after the quality standard ISO 9001. Because of cost cutting and other reasons, uh, we lost the other two compliance specialists and Chris was, um, was there by himself. And um, he had to maintain and implement all three standards, maintain all the actions arising and of course the internal audits, which no one wanted to help with. Um, so we have these compliance people who get stressed out. And um, I think one of the problems with compliance is um, lack of some of the direction given from executive management. So the success of any compliance obligation and following systems is uh, directly proportional to management commitment. So I think that's not a bad place to start. So mm. I've no doubt we've got some senior execs here today. So I think the first thing to prevent that from happening is uh, avoid the ignorance and just find out exactly what we have to comply with. Yeah. Um, mm. So we'll talk a little bit about Chris later on. Mm. And um, I, I was speaking with a, a Chris yesterday, one of my students, and she uh, from the Aboriginal health sector has 10 standards that she's currently responsible for and um, yeah, very frustrated, very stressed. And she's a fantastic operator, but <laughs> it's very stressful. So all right, so um, let's talk about um, uh, best practice. So uh, 19, oh, first of all, Jeff, do you just quickly want to just um, provide a little overview of what ISO actually is for those yeah. who might not be familiar? Yeah, ISO is um, an organisation that's based in Geneva, Switzerland. They don't write the standards. They're just responsible for project managing the development of them. But um, what they do is if there's enough people interested in a particular flavour or cohort or uh, regulatory sense, they will um, take representation and develop a technical committee, develop a standard, put it out there for comment. And if better than 75% of 175 nations agree with it, it becomes a standard uh, mm -hmm. for which industry may or may not, not use. What we do in Australia is uh, we, we like to comply with ISO standards as well. So as Lauren mentioned, the um, current document is a guideline. It's got no shells in it, but lots of um, shoulds. Mm. And it's going to be replaced in April with ISO 37301, mm. uh, which is the compliance uh, standard, which will contain the shells. Mm. Um, so that's that's where we go. So you will see that later this year it will become a AS slash ISO standard when Standards Australia formally adopt it, but not yet. Hmm. And I think um, it's a document that I only come across last year. And when I was started to speak to some of the clients I'm working with and students, 
they, they had never actually heard of this, um, you know, compliance management guideline either. And when you read it, it's actually really helpful. Um, and just to give you a little bit of information about it, it, it really is about identifying, um, you know, effective compliance management, um, you know, is so important. And, and to maintain a, a, a culture and a sense of integrity and in compliance in, in your business really does lead to that long-term success and a sustainable business as well that can be relied upon. Um, and I think, you know, there are a lot of uh, similar uh, requirements of um, this management uh, compliance management guideline, where, again, there's a strong focus on leadership governance and, you know, improvement, which is something that we've seen in the other um, popular ISO management standards, such as the quality, environmental and safety. Um, but the difference is, you know, 37301 will be a uh, certification standard that people can choose to be certified against. But I think, um, you know, what's important here is really the message that comes from the guidelines. You don't need to be certified to this unless obviously it becomes a requirement, you know, within your industry or whatever. But to be able to just get a look at the, have a look at the document and to be guided by it, um, you know, there's absolutely some really great content. And this also forms the basis. Um, we see ISO as one of the best practice as well, as well as our other research that we conduct in relation to compliance and things are always changing too. Um, so this is really the basis for our webinar and the steps that we're going to actually take you through. But before Jeff does that, I just wanted to talk about well, what when we talk about compliance, what are we actually talking about? So ISO says, you know, compliance is about meeting an obligation. Um, it is a requirement or a commitment. And compliance, um, they see, and we see as well, is actually one of the most significant risks to business. So if you are someone that is conducting risk assessments or um, scans across your organisation, depending on, you know, what you, what you do, um, you know, I dare say that non-compliance will potentially um, be a constant risk that will be raised potentially as, as something to manage and keep an eye on. So uh, when we look at, well, where do we even begin with compliance obligations? They can be derived from various sources, um, depending on the type of industry that you're working. So they can come from our requirements of stakeholders, and they can also surface from external or internal issues as well. Um, and uh, it's important to note the compliance obligations are a mixture of requirements, so the musts, we have to comply with this, and as well as the commitments, we choose to do this, which we are choosing, we're committing to, um, you know, meeting these, these um, things. And uh, Aaron, how does this standard relate to the Work Health Safety Act? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and I suppose we're going to see um, more of that uh, next month. I, I believe, you know, as it stands currently now, um, you know, it is the, the guideline is a more holistic approach. So work health safety is absolutely something that needs to be considered. But really, uh, compliance management uh, from an ISO perspective and also from our perspective is much broader than just work health safety matters. We need to be managing compliance from all areas of the business, whether it be finance, human resources, um, you know, as well as work health safety as well, quality, risk. Um, so, yeah, um, it's just sort of one facet of, um, of the guideline as well. But really good question. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so a requirement. So just to give you some examples and these things are, are pretty much, you know, obvious, you know, these are things that you have to comply with. So any type of laws or regulations, any types of specific licenses or permits that you might need, depending on the business that you're in or the industry that you're in, um, any type of, you know, orders, rules, regulatory guides, and so on and so forth. And down here, practically, you know, what does that look like? You know, in Australia, we all have to abide by these types of laws. So privacy, employment, anti-bullying, intellectual property as well, uh, work health safety or OHS, depending on where you are, laws and regulations, and then also human rights. And then there's also those industry specific acts as well. So Food Safety Act, your Rail Safety Act, if you're in the NDIS space, the National Disability Insurance Scheme Act and so on and so forth. If you're not sure or if you are want, wanting to know whether or not, you know, you're covering all these or you'd like more information, below I've listed two excellent websites. Um, Business.gov.au is a really good one. If you um, search for legal essentials for business in Australia, 
um, they come up with fantastic, like there's lots of resources there, loads. And it's not just for new businesses registering here as well. It's also for existing businesses that can come back um, and have a look, especially if you've, you've undergone some, you know, fairly rapid growth over the years too. So it will cover, give you information, everything from fair trading through to employment, through to uh, contractors, unfair dismissal, environmental, all of it's there. You can also search via industry as well, which is really handy. And same with Safe Work Australia. I'm sure that some of you have already probably familiar uh, with that website, maybe. Um, if not, it is a really great resource. Again, no matter whether you, which state or territory you're actually from, check uh, Safe Work Australia, focus more on work health safety, obviously, but it, it's just got some really great um, templates, checklists, um, assessment tools, you name it, it's there. Everything from COVID-19 through to, you know, the human um, uh, resource area of work health safety as well, right down to actual the safety, um, you know, on the ground stuff. So really great resources. Uh, and then obviously commitment. So the things that we want to do because they align with our organisation values, maybe because we choose to play in a space that we want to be in, uh, we want to attract certain types of um, contracts or funding as well. Um, so these are things that you, you would choose to comply with agreements from organisations, community, your service users, customers, as well as your internal requirements, so your policies and procedures and processes. Um, and so some examples here of those other ISO standards too, for some, it might be a must, it might actually fall into the requirement category. And for others, it might be a commitment that they choose to make for marketing reasons or, um, you know, to really elevate their business. I've also included 26,000 social responsibility, doesn't really get a lot of airtime, but it is becoming a lot more popular, um, really aimed at sort of corporations, but still very relevant for smaller organisations too. Um, but if they've got, there's a code for everything, even in research, I came across the golf course code, which I thought was quite funny, but, um, you know, no one's ever left out, is there? So that's good. All right. And so why would we bother wanting to effectively manage compliance in our business? you know, other than the fact that we have to, um, you know, assurance that business is, is under control, it can really provide that assurance, especially for that um, leadership team there to, to be able to sleep at night, to go, everything's under control, we're on track, and we're, we're doing a really good job out there. And whether whatever type of service you're providing, um, you know, or, or um, product that you're producing, um, it really does um, take the load off to have an effective compliance management system that could be integrated in, in the various areas of your business. Um, also too, the landscape is constantly changing as we all know. So there is constantly new rules, new regulations, new laws, things are changing and we have to be able to demonstrate that we're keeping on top of it all. And with that, there are new liability issues consistently emerging for management. And so we need to be able to keep a lid on those things and be ahead of the game. And also as we all feel, and even in our space as well, we all feel a growing regulatory presence that is consistently on our black. Um, prior to my role here, I've come from a very uh, tight uh, regulatory, you know, um, uh, system um, being the police force. And so I get also from that perspective of someone, one of the doers, um, you know, out there going, I just want to do my job. And it just feels like sometimes it's just red tape after red tape. However, we've got to work about how we can actually work that in together to really achieve our business goals as well and take our businesses to the next level. And obviously, if by effectively managing compliance, we're going to prevent hopefully wrongdoing and any type of breaches that could really land the company into hot water. So not only bringing us into disrepute, but staying out of jail, staying um, not copying really large fines and in some other cases you know people can lose their lives especially in a work health safety aspect you know considerations um yeah so there's you know there's lots of really good reasons why we want to do this work and also too at the end of the day our stakeholders expect businesses to do the right thing especially here in Australia so you know effective compliance management really does lead to that reduction of your liability risks and it also builds trust and confidence with your audience so not only your current clients and other stakeholders but also your future ones to to attract the right people to you too 
So I hope that's okay so far. This is now, we're just gonna go through um, the steps of effective compliance management. And this is a bit of an overview of where you would start. Now, um, this is something that can be fluid at times. You know, they're not um, definitive steps, but it's just some information that you might like to consider um, next time that you, you're looking at your compliance and how you manage that in the business. So it really begins with obviously, you know, identifying what you need to know. And that could be in terms of the scope. So on a, on a, a person level that could be a new employee their roles and responsibilities them really understanding it um, you know what are their responsibilities in terms of the type of compliance activities they need to be engaged with and meeting um, and then also interpreting those requirements as well what does that mean for the bigger picture is this a commitment is this a requirement what's the priority what's the risk as well so always applying this risk lens with everything we do right through to documenting obviously planning how we're going to go about that the doing the action how, how do we actually are going to manage compliance and then also checking and making sure that we are we're on track we're doing the right things and if we do find gaps great we've found them let's let's get on board it and improve our systems and if we do detect a breach or a non-conformance, that's okay. Let's just have a process in place of how we're going to manage that in order to be able to, you know, take corrective action and then feed into continuous improvement back into our um, organisations. So I'll now throw over to Jeff um, with step one, identify. All right. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, look, we've just put together these little eight steps. Um, for those of you who have already got a, a standard in place or a compliance framework in place, it's, um, it's going to be helpful to see if there's anything being missed. For those who are new to this, um, it'll give you some structure. And for those who um, um, maybe have multiple standards already, um, it's going to be relevant too. So, um, and as Lauren said, there's no demarcation between these eight steps. They're all things that need to be done. We've just put, put them in some sort of order, but it's uh, the chicken and the egg, so to speak, in some cases. So. Step one, obviously, is um, we might get a contract and find out that we have to comply with something or we can see a trend down the track and say, look, we better do this in an orderly fashion. Otherwise, we might be in strife in a couple of years time. Um, it becomes a requirement of our business from a legal perspective that wasn't there before. Or maybe it's always been there. We just haven't been caught out as yet. So there might be many, many drivers, but um, the first thing is, is to get off on the front foot and find out, well, exactly what have we got to comply with? Um, you mentioned your colleague before, Lauren, that she's looking after 10, 10 standards across 40 sites. Well, that's just massive if you're going to do the whole lot in one hit. So maybe we need to scope this out and say, we are a big organisation or there's three streams to our business. How about we just do one stream and make all the mistakes there and then migrate it later. Or maybe we go 40 sites all up, which is a big thing. Um, but um, we need to work out how big this task is going to be. And um, we need to find out what our stakeholders are wanting, those upstream and downstream. So an, an environmental scan is a popular way of doing it these days where we go and talk to all our stakeholders, both within and external to our business, up and down the supply chain and say, exactly what are your expectations? Um, uh, what would you like us to meet? Um, and find out exactly what you have to comply with. And once you need to do that, you need to collect all these, or once you've done that, you need to collect all these criteria and become educated in what all the requirements are. And a lot of writers of these uh, compliance obligations are not savvy to your particular industry, some are quite generic, in which case we need to um, establish the criteria and then perhaps interpret, um, which is coming up. Um, what does it mean to us? Um, is one size fits all? I don't think so. So we need to make sure that we understand exactly what the um, criteria is that we must, must have. Are there any things that we currently do that we can integrate with this? Um, let's let's do it for the right reasons, as Lauren mentioned before, not because we have to. Mm. But if it is mandatory, well, why don't we do it for good reasons and include all the other things, all the other criteria? 
Um, one thing we might do right up front is start to collate all this criteria and establish a little compliance register, which you know, in a, could be a simple Excel spreadsheet, which lists all our federal and state obligations um, our industry-based standards. Uh, there may be requirements or standards that our clients are putting pressure on that we need to comply with. Anything that we need to comply with, um, we could include all sorts of things outside the scope of these standards, but we know um, are necessary, for example, uh, finance and, and those sorts of things. And uh, set up a little compliance register, which basically covers all the things we have to do and um, even right down to the detail and make sure this register is kept up to date. Um, okay, step two is um, now that we've, we understand what our needs and wants are of our stakeholders uh, through this communication, um, we need to um, work out a methodology of how we're going to meet this criteria. So often these criteria will say, you've just got to have documentation or you've just got to have a policy or, or both or not at all. So what does it mean for us? Um, sometimes we need external people to come in and, and give us a, a bit of a heads up. Um, as an RCO, we use external experts to help us with our running of our registered training organization, which is, can be sensible. Uh, do your research. And just because others have done certain things, it doesn't mean to say you have to do it the same way. So often people are quite um, desperate and they tend to plagiarise what other people have done and wonder why it doesn't work for them. So, um, yeah, I think um, I think that's that's all enough for uh, step two there, interpret. Um, we can then work out how we're we going to document it all. The reason why we document things is so it's able to be communicated. If it's not written down or um, in electronic format or some some documented format, then people can't understand what it is that we're trying to do. So all these compliance codes of practices and anything you can think of all have requirements for documenting and documenting is, you know, code for communicating. If it's not documented, people can't understand. So there's lots of platforms and software platforms we could use. We could set up our own uh, intranet service um, um, platform, if you like, which is quite common. Um, and one thing we've got to be very careful with is that, uh, as I said, one size does not fit all. Mm. We, um, we need to avoid war and peace. And often, often we see uh, people plagiarise other systems and we know from history that does not work. So it's got to look like your organisation. It's got to feel like your organisation. It's got to sound like your organisation and uh, which will take your, all your stakeholders on board. Um, proportionate is, is, a, is a fashionable term these days, especially in um, the services sector. Um, you know, the risk is the big driver here. Um, if you had a uh, compliance management system, well, it's going to be different between some of your organisations that might only have 20 or so employees, say, compared to a large organisation like um, a big airline like Qantas. So it needs to be proportionate. And equally, both size organisations can comply. And if there is an audit process down, down the back end of this um, whole process, then the auditors so, or the audit process needs to respect that proportionate. So one size does not fit all. It's, it's all to do with risk. So usually those organisations that um, have a lot of risk um, have a much more thorough or a much more detailed system than those that do not. Um, so I think that's, that's um, a good point there to think Mm. Okay. And, that, and that sort of links back to that compliance register that you mentioned um, yeah. earlier in the piece too, but it also can be like, you know, your policies, your procedures as well, and, um, you know, even your position descriptions too, having that all documented too. But one sort of overall arching document to bring it all together would be really helpful. Yeah, I, I, I went to an Aboriginal health um, establishment in um, Catherine some years ago and they had to comply with um, health, and, health and safety standards, the human states, um, services standards. Um, there are certain health requirements because they delivered um, frontline primary health care. Mm. And they had ISO to boot. And um, I spoke to the, the elders there before we started. And I spent uh, four hours having a chat. 
and uh, they showed me their, it was called the, um, uh, the Sunrise Way, which was um, their story. And I read the story because I wasn't allowed in until I did. And it was just wonderful. It just told the story about how they comply with, with all their requirements in a logical sequence, but not in a standard sequence yeah. that would please an external audit process. But it, it actually took everyone on side and it really meant something for them. Um, I thought that is just, just fantastic. And it was uh, tailored to suit. Yeah. You mentioned risk-based approach, Lauren. Well, what's the point of spending all your time on low risk activities when you've got bigger fish to fry? So that's a logical approach these days. Um, all throughout these steps, not in any particular one step, but I think communication is the key. Uh, we, need, we need to tell our stakeholders what we're going to do at the start. We need to tell them what we have done at the end if there is an end and all throughout the implementation process, keep people um, up to speed there. And, and don't feel like that you're the font of all knowledge. The, the, the power of knowledge is actually within your organization across all your employees and stakeholders. So get their input, um, get their ownership um, and um, you'll find that that will be more successful. Mm -hmm. um, and there's plenty of examples there on the slide of um, part of the planning process, uh, not to mention that uh, we need to have some sort of design of this management system there, but it's a lot on your plate, like to work out what policies you've got, procedures, you know, just on that point, a lot of standards will have requirements, which might be a, a procedure or an instruction or a plan or something like that. And for every clause of all these compliance criteria, people also put together a policy on that because it's listed, we mm -hmm. must have a policy. Uh, which is not so. If we pick the health and safety standard, you only need one safety standard policy for that. And the rest are all just documents of your choosing. So of, because of ignorance, a lot of companies go overboard because they think the more they document, the more chance they've got of being successful. But I think the reverse occurs, just becomes too clogged up. Um, you know, complaints management often is reactive. Um, same as compliments, they're not formally recorded. As an RTO, we have to keep uh, records of this so we can um, actually take the good from that and trends and it's very powerful. So we need to set up workout systems if they're not already there to, to cover all this, this off. Um, I think uh, stakeholder engagement is, um, is needed at the start and early on in the process, um, our suppliers and subcontractors and people we bring into the organization, plus, plus all our clients that we, um, we deal with. I think they all need to have a say, plus our regulators too, of course. Um, for those who have systems in place already, the internal audit process is gonna help. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than focusing on what you've got now, that can be broadened. And um, of course, as I've mentioned, staff training all throughout the process there. <clears throat> so I would think a, a little project plan, a time-based pro project plan would would help here. Some people call it a Gantt Gan chart, which can be very complicated, but a simple Excel spreadsheet from, you know, from where to go um, with a reasonable time frame. Um, another mistake here in the planning stage is that people think they're much more optimistic, um, which is nothing wrong with that, but um, they say they're going to do it all in six months and they realise that they're halfway through that they're not going to make that target. So I would be very cautious about um, the time frame, but if you make it three years, then it's going to wither on the vine and all that early training will be wasted. So if you can come up with a reasonable time frame, frame that is achievable within the resources you've got, um, keep, the, keep the ball rolling, so to speak. And um, not to forget that, um, yeah, we need to um, have updates as we go. So we've, we've worked out what we have to comply with. We've, um, we've worked out uh, how we're going to do it. Um, I think uh, somewhere in here, we need to allocate some roles and responsibilities. Uh, we can't just handball this to one person. <clears throat> um, people say, oh, but it's expensive if you involve others, we'll slow it down. But, you know, what does it cost you if you don't do it properly? So I think this needs to be properly resourced. So around here, or maybe earlier, we need to allocate some roles and responsibilities of who is going to do that in a large organisation? It might be a team. 
as opposed to just one person in a small, small um, organization. Step five is, well, we've done all this work, we've designed it all, we've got our policies, we've got our procedures, and I don't know how many people uh, we find when we do audits within organisations do not know of the existence of those procedures. And we'll be doing audits and they'll say, where did you get that requirement from? Oh, it's in this procedure here and it says, I didn't even know we had that procedure is the response. So I think um, another quick story, I went out to this uh, electronics company and um, they wanted a compliance management system from way to go. And um, he said, we need policies, we need procedures, we need plans, we need everything. We haven't got anything. <clears throat> and in my little um, research before I went there, I found out that they had all their procedures, they had all their policies, they had everything documented from go to woe um, on their intranet site uh, or um, internet site, which was uh, externally accessible but the CEO was not aware that someone had already done it all. So I think it's great to have all this stuff, but if it's not uh, promulgated throughout, you're wasting your time. Um, training of staff comes up again there. So quite, we need some sort of flexibility. Um, we need to be generous with our time it takes to put in and documenting, no one sort of fights over that. Um, it's very tedious to write procedures. And as soon as you do, they people who have to Sorry. comply with them, find out what, what the problems say? are. Um, but that's what you want. You want the feedback to get those policies and procedures right. Um, I went to another company and they were holding back and had all their policies and procedures and, and whatnot. And um, I think you've got Siri talking to you. I don't know, well, I'm sorry, Siri, but I'll help you later. <laughs> I think um, someone's, uh, Elise has just mentioned that she can only see the Y slide, the computer. I'm hoping that um, this hasn't frozen for everyone. Um, and if it is, I apologise. You'll be able to um, see these, uh, these this slideshow back um, if you want. I'm on step five. Oh, good. Thanks, Tricia. Good. It might just be your internet connection, Elise. Sorry about that. Sorry to interrupt you, Jeff. No, that's okay. No, we've got to take everyone with us. Um, Elise says, no worries. Yep. Okay, good, thanks for the feedback. Yeah, so people have all these wonderful plans and mm -hmm. wonderful documents, wonderful policies, but you actually got to walk the talk. Yeah. And please don't hang off until they're perfect because part of getting them perfect is to implement them and then knock them into shape and use your auditing to, to fine tune that. And um, yeah. And of course, um, training again comes up with your staff there. Absolutely. And I can I just interrupt there? Yeah. Because I'm currently doing a lot of audits in the NDIS space. I've seen a lot of providers who buy off the shelf policies and procedures, and I'm not knocking that at all, because if you've got to start somewhere, you've got to start somewhere. However, there is a distinct gap of there's been no implementation with a lot of the staff. So when in conversation with staff during the audit, they actually have no idea what the procedure is in relation to some really key high risk areas um, of the business. So, you know, the doing is is so essential um, and that implementation um, and letting your staff know, um, you know, what's actually there. It, it can't just sit on the shelf, can it look nice? It actually has to work for you. So mm -hmm. should we go to step six? Yeah, yeah. So I think step six is um, uh, the check stage, but we're doing this all the way through. But for those who have a robust audit audit process this is one of the one of the things it's the glue that sticks it all together if you've got an internal audit process maybe you get an external expert and come in and do a, a technical based audit to work out where your gaps are mm. but i think internal audits are, are more valuable but um become good at documenting all your results become good at formally recording any problems we have um if we do get some complaints and compliments, make sure they're formally reported. We do audits and we find that a lot of companies have all this information, but it's just not recorded. And um, they don't have evidence to show that later, but it's also good to have evidence to, to give you a trend analysis so that um, of all the complaints we've had, you know, 80% are because of this one or, or whatever. So if you look at all these um, uh, results that are being flagged up in the check stage, um, it's very powerful to look at the trend 
of where they're coming from and what the subjects are, because you, you can be much more objective with your solutions. Um, so I've made a few little notes here, and I think I've covered all that, but um, yeah, complaints, uh, compliments, trends, and lessons learned in the construction and mining sectors, they're very good at that. And we've got Andrew here today from the level crossing removals process, and Andrew knows all about that one, but <laughs> because they go from one station to another station and they learn heaps. And um, obviously it's smart to do that so that if you've got a, a project rollout or if you've got a number of clients we need to be helping, we can uh, stop making the same mistakes twice. So I think that's a valuable and formal process that all industry could, could um, uh, gear up for. All right. Got a step six, uh, seven, I should say. Act. That's it. Um, action. <laughs> well, we've already done a lot of action here, but um, as I say here, make it the new normal here. So all this stuff we've done, we've better down our procedures. We've um, uh, worked out and met all our requirements. Our auditing is telling us we're going okay. Um, we'll then advertise the fact that this is now the new normal and this is the way we run. So um, some of the things there has become good at investigating problems or solving problems with non-conformances. We've been one of my pet subjects for 20 years. A lot of people just do Band-Aid solutions. But uh, when we're talking about things that are preventable that should not have happened and our clients are upset because of it, or maybe it's cost us money or an unsafe issue, we often do a lot of Band-Aid work, whereas um, you can't solve a problem unless we dig in and find out what the root causes are. So um, part of this um, compliance framework is being very, very good at solving problems um, just once, not ma many, many recurring times, and taking appropriate corrective action based on that root cause. Mm. So I think we need to get um, more formal there, uh, good at problem solving. Mm. And uh, the last bit is um, publish our results and um, advertise the fact that we're going along okay. Uh, look for ways to improve. Um, our audits are gonna show that up. Our feedback from clients and stakeholders is gonna do that as well. Make sure that this compliance is, um, all the uh, issues are reviewed during the management review process. Uh, there is a process in this standard that talks about that. Make sure that, as we said, leadership is there. So rather than sort of um, be a follower, take the lead on this and uh, get your senior execs involved as well. And uh, yeah, there's always room for improvement. So just to sum up, I think um, compliance is a, can be quite onerous. Um, sometimes uh, people overdo it, um, a lot of people underdo it, but I think it's a, it's a license to be in business in the future. If you don't uh, proactively seek out all your criteria and work out what you have to comply with and then nail it, um, well, the future may not be as bright as it should be, but mm. taking a positive approach, um, just think of all the opportunities that may emerge mm. uh, in the future. So um, I think that's all I need to say this. Absolutely. Thanks, for, thanks very much um, for that. That was really good. So um, please stay in touch with us. These are our contact details here. Um, I'm about to stop sharing the screen so I can, um, I'll just quickly type in our email addresses. Um, I'm about to open up the floor for, for questions. So if there is anything that you'd like to um, ask, please ask away, or you could um, email us or contact us at, at another time. Um, so we'll just see, uh, there was one question for before, but we answered that. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any comments from the floor or any thoughts about today's presentation. Thank you. That was a great refresher. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm not sure who that was from, but I think that's um, a yeah, that's wonderful. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, no, look, I just want to thank everyone um, for participating today. Um, we've had a wonderful turnout. Um, we will, um, we often will deliver our webinars. Um, if you're in the NDIS space, I'm actually got a webinar running tomorrow where I'm interviewing someone who's uh, quite well versed in advocacy. So you can head to our website to uh, sign up there for that. But look, every month we do offer a some form of, um, you know, webinar um, as a way to connect with our community and our people. Um, so please feel free to, to join um, us um, in future webinars. And um, if you have any 
questions or you'd like to connect with Jeff, like I said before, just email us or give us a call. So um, thank you to all for, for attending. We really appreciate um, you being here and best of luck out there as well. You're all doing amazing work. So take care and um, we'll finish there if there's no more questions. I think we're all good. Just, Jim. Just one little thing, if I may, yes. Lauren. If, if anyone's got any other subjects in the compliance sector they'd like us to discuss. Yes. Or anyone who would like to be interviewed uh, for a, a 30 second, a 30 minute short session. Yes. We're open to that too. Absolutely. And there's a few people that have asked about sharing this presentation. Absolutely. Um, we actually, we've just commenced a YouTube channel. Sounds very, very exciting, doesn't it? Um, it's not too exciting just yet, but we will upload that too. And you will um, be sent a link of how to access that. So please feel free to share this with your colleagues. Um, and I can also email you a uh, copy of the PDF um, slides as well that you can refer to. Um, remember, if you do, I know a few people have asked for certificates if that's something important for your HR records please email me and um and I will generate a certificate for you a certificate for you by the end of the week so um Tanya says HACCP compliance yeah. would be interested in our business absolutely yes and we've, um, we've done that in the past if I could just answer Tanya yes um if you want a little book on HACCP um I've got a one day training program Tanya and I don't mind if I was to send you that book so if you were to, yep, please, yep. good. All right. I'll be right. in contact with you and we'll send you a copy of our little HACCP book that I put together. Okay. Oh, and Aaron, and, yep, Aaron, for a certificate. Aaron. And Aaron, if you want me to speak to your um, present boss, <laughs> I don't mind doing that. We actually can run little short 30 minute sessions, which we don't charge for, where we can talk to people in need of um, an extra bit of information so we can help in that regard too it's it's time for me to give back in my career which i love doing so uh, feel free no, that's good no we enjoy what we do and um i have to say we have some really great clients and students that come to us and it's an absolute pleasure and um certainly drives us to get out of bed in the morning so it's good fun all right thanks everyone we'll leave it there we really appreciate you showing up today so thank you take care